Hi Grade 11s, I'm John, it's great to be with you again. Today we're going to be looking at energy and the role energy plays in chemical change. So get ready for a really exciting session because this is really practical chemistry. And there's some important fundamental things that you're going to need to know that are going to build in your Grade 11 syllabus to what you're going to need to answer in Grade 12. So let's have a look at the overview for the topics that we're going to be covering, the little sections that we're going to be covering, terminology that you need to know in today's session. So here we go. And we're going to start by saying, what are the key concepts? And in this session, the, these are the things that you're going to need to, to know about. We'll be summarizing some ideas about activation energy and the activation complex. Then we'll look at the idea of an energy profile. We'll move on and relate the energy profile to two things. We're going to relate it to enthalpy and the idea of an exo endothermic and exothermic reaction. And then, of course, the last thing we're going to look at is the role that a catalyst plays. What is a catalyst and how does it operate? Well, let's jump right in and let's start by talking about this idea of activation energy. Now, you know, if we've got a piece of paper sitting here and uh, nothing much is happening, we know that there's oxygen around here, and you might be wondering, well, we know that paper is basically made up of carbon, and we know that oxygen and carbon, they react together. We see it almost every day. If you have a little spark, then paper will burn. But on its own, it's not reacting. Why is that? Well, the simple answer is that we need activation energy. So let's go and have a look at what we mean by activation energy. So what we're saying is here, activation energy is sometimes given the symbol Ea. And what it means is it's the energy required to start a reaction, to get a reaction going, to start a reaction. Now, remember that molecules are moving around and if we've got reactants those are the things that we start with so it's very important that we understand some terminology there we're only getting a chemical change if the reactants change in their nature to form new substances which we know as products so I'm going to illustrate that on a molecular level remember that we've got reactants and I'm just going to draw two reactants at this stage I'm going to say, let's take a molecule that is a diatomic molecule and another one that is also diatomic, just draw them in different colors. And what we're saying is these are reactants. For chemical change to take place, we can't be left with the same things at the end. Remember that there is a difference between chemical change and physical change. So if we started with a reactant and we ended up with the same reactant in a different phase or a different form, so it started as a solid and it's now a liquid, or it started as a liquid and it's now a gas, that's not a chemical change. Yes, you're going to need energy to make those changes as well, but what we're looking at is energy and chemical change. We've got two reactants, and it's really important that you take note of that. The reactants combined, and they will produce something called a product. So at the end, we're going to get something different. We're going to get something like this. This is a simple example. Just change the color so that you can see. And these are known as the product molecules. So we started with reactant molecules and we've ended up with product molecules. So that's the substance that is formed. But how did we get there? What was required? Well, the first thing that you're going to need is some energy. You're going to need to give these 
molecules sufficient energy so that when they collide with each other, that they can actually have enough energy to break their bonds that are holding them together and to form new bonds. Very important to note. Now there is an intermediate stage and I want to show you that intermediate stage. We call that intermediate stage an activation complex. So what do you think it will look like? Let's have a look at the drawing. If we take our two molecule, uh, our molecules here that were the reactant molecules, they're bonded together and we take the second reactant and we say look let's bring them close together as if they've collided. Now we've got bonds between the two green uh, atoms and we've got bonds between the two pink ones but we've also formed temporary bonds between the pink and the green and the pink and the green. So this is an intermediate. It's not a stable. It's unstable. Very important to notice that this is unstable. It could fall apart and go back to forming the original or it could go on to forming the product. So we call this an activation complex. Now to form this activation complex we've noted already that you're going to need some energy to get it going. When we form the product we will also release some energy. So there's energy that's lost here, energy that's released. So this is energy that's taken in, that's absorbed. And this is energy that's released. So in this whole process, to get chemical change, we start with the reactants, we're needing energy, and we're going to form the products, and we're going to release some energy. Now, what is interesting is to try and take a note of how the energy relates to each other. And so that's what, we, that's what chemists do. They draw something called an energy profile. And it lists the potential energy of the reactants and the potential energy of the products as well as the potential energy of the activation complex. And so that's our next thing that we're going to take a look at. We're going to take a look at energy profiles. So here we go. Energy profile of a reaction. So I'm going to draw two profiles and we're going to start with this one. I want you to notice something. We start with the energy of the reactants. So I'm just going to draw it over here, and I'm going to say, here's the energy of the reactants. That's your starting energy. We call this potential energy. And this isn't really a time uh, reaction because the reaction's going on all the time. And so different molecules will be at different stages. But it's just a course of reaction. It's sometimes called the reaction coordinate. So I'm going to call, label it as that. And it just means for the, the, the continuation of the reaction, the reaction coordinate. Okay. So during the course of the reaction, we've got the reactants. Now, at the end of the reaction, let's say that the potential energy of the product is less than the energy of the reactants. So there's the product. And so it has less energy. Let's now fill in what has to happen. We're going to need to take in some energy. And that energy that we absorb, that we take in, is going to be called the activation energy. The activation energy, E with a small a, and I'm going to say that it goes up to form an activation complex. Now, we draw the profile as a curve. We're going to say this is your activation complex. And so we draw it as a bit of a, a curve like that, something like that. And you can see it, it gives the picture of a hill. It's like we have to get up the hill, we have to absorb some energy. So this is the energy that's being absorbed between there and there. That's the activation energy. And this is the energy that is released. This is the energy released. 
Now, I'm sure you can see from this diagram that more energy is released than is absorbed. So the energy of the products, the potential energy of the products is less than the potential energy of the reactants. This is a particular example of one form of reaction, but it gives you a particular idea of the energy profile. I hope you can see that. Now, what are the other uh, options? What are the other alternatives to this diagram? Well, there is another case. So let's have a look at the other case where the potential energy of the uh, um, products is greater than the potential energy of the reactants. Let's draw that diagram. So drawing a similar energy profile. And what we have, something like that. Let's start with the reactants um, over here. So this is the reactants. And let's make the energy of the products over here. Always make sure you label your, your axes. This is the reaction coordinate. And this is potential energy. The potential energy of the molecules. And so what's going to happen? We're still going to take in energy. We're going to need to get energy to get the reaction going. It's not going to happen on its own. And what we find over here is that, sure you can see, that there was more energy absorbed. So the activation energy here is greater than the energy released. This is the energy released. OK, so when we've got these two different profiles, can we classify reactions as being different? What do we expect to see when we get more energy released than absorbed? What do we expect to see when we get less energy? Well, think about it. Let's take some examples. If we take a simple one, put a little spark, and you light a candle, what do you notice? Well, you get a flame. You're getting energy released. That both heat and light is being released. So just a little spark, and you've got lots of energy released. Another example of that sort of combustion reaction is uh, if, we, if we burn anything. If we take some magnesium, we light it, just a little spark. And the next thing, you've got this brilliant white flame. Those are all giving off more energy than what we've produced, than what we put in. So more energy is released than what we put in. These explosion type reactions are all given a special name. They are releasing energy. Energy is given out. More energy is given out than is absorbed. So that's the first profile. Giving you some examples here, we give it a name and we say that this is an exothermic reaction. Let's just break that word down. Exo is like exit. It's given out. Thermic is like thermal. So this is about, if you think about it, thermal is like heat. And exo is out. So I hope you can see exothermic heat is given out. Well, we've given some examples. The examples are burning of magnesium magnesium plus oxygen, or a candle burning. Candle burning. It's giving out energy. We can see visible signs of this. Now, what about an endothermic reaction? That's the second type that we've got here. This is known, as I've said, endothermic reaction. Interesting word. N End, endo, sorry, my spelling wasn't very good. Endothermic. Remember, we said thermic is heat. Endo means in. So he, more heat is given in than is released. So more heat over there, 
less heat over there, endothermic reaction. Now, in this case, what we find is that in these type of reactions, the temperature of the mixture can decrease. And so when you're reacting things and you notice that there's not a, an, incre a, an increase in the temperature but a decrease, you've got an endothermic reaction. And, and there are different types of these. S some of them are involving when you dissolve salts. Certain salts, one example is ammonium chloride. And if you dissolve ammonium chloride in water, uh, you react it with water, it will decrease in temperature. It actually gets cold. Practical example of an endothermic reaction where this particular substance is used is in coal packs. You can go to a pharmacy, you can go to a physio, and they have this coal pack that you can break, it releases, mix the, mixes the substance together, and it actually gets really cold. Very interesting idea. Now, they're not just spectacular reactions, but they are just ordinary reactions as long as the temperature decreases. And there are a number of these. Sometimes uh, there are probably more exothermic reactions than endothermic reactions, but these are just as important. They're absorbing energy from the system, from the environment. So the reaction mixture decreases in temperature. And that's how we can tell that you've got an endothermic reaction. Okay, now scientists obviously want to measure the change in energy. We've got this lovely energy profile, but can we measure and can we do some calculations with them? Well, yes we can. And there's a special word that we need to explain and introduce uh, that relates to these energy profiles, and it's called enthalpy. Right, enthalpy has another name. It's called heat of reaction. We give this a special symbol, call it delta H. And you'll hear lots of people saying, what's the delta H value? Well, there's a complicated calculation that if you continue studying chemistry, you'll find out about. We're going to simplify it. We're going to say delta H is the energy of the product, or the products, minus the energy of the reactants. There is another way of writing that same thing and it's important to know this as well. It's by saying the activation energy, the energy that we've put in, minus the energy that is released. Right, now let's take this formula that we've just developed for delta H, for heat of reaction, enthalpy, and let's apply it to the two energy profiles. Because sometimes what we do is we represent the delta H value, the enthalpy value, on an energy profile. You can even be asked to do some calculations with it. Let's start by looking at the exothermic reaction. So here we go, exothermic reaction. And I'm going to apply both equations, and you're going to have a look at that in terms of what the energy profile looks like. Here you've got the energy profile. Notice that the energy of the product and the, is less than the energy of the reactant. So we've got a smaller number minus a bigger number. So energy of the product is smaller, and we're going to put that down. So Delta H here is going to be energy of the product, which remember was small, minus the energy of the reactant. And this one was small, and this one was bigger. Okay, so what are we going to get when we take a smaller value minus a bigger value. I hope you can see that you're going to get an answer that is going to be a negative value. You're going to get a negative value. It's going to be minus. In other words, it's going to be delta H is less than zero. It's a negative value. <clears throat> 
let's use the second definition for the same product or the same uh, type of reaction. We're going to say, remember what we did here, the activation energy minus the energy released. The activation energy, Ea, minus the energy released. Now, notice something here. This again is a small value, and this here is a big value because it's exothermic. More energy was released, and again, you're going to get a negative answer. It's going to be negative. So we're going to say that delta H is less than zero. It's going to be negative. Check it out on the energy profile just to make sure. Look, the activation energy is only that amount, that amount. We're going to take that minus that. You're going to get a negative value. Well, let's move on to the endothermic profile. And here you've got it. Notice it's going to be different. You've got more energy over here. Look where the reactant is. The reactant is a smaller value, and the product value is a, a, a larger value. So if we take that and we do it for the endothermic reaction, see what we're going to get. We're going to get endothermic reaction. Now, what happens? Delta H, we're going to take the energy of the product. We started with the energy of the product, and we're going to subtract the energy of the reactant. And we're going to subtract energy of the reactant. And over here, in our endothermic profile, the energy of the product is big. It's higher up. This one is small. So if we go to that one, I hope you can see you've got a big value minus a small value. So what happens when you've got that? You're going to get a positive answer. Delta H is going to be greater than zero. Remember, the zero is smaller. Which side is the crocodile snapping towards? The bigger one. So this is bigger than zero. Make sure that you can interpret those signs and you've got it very clearly. If we do it with the other equation, we're going to say the energy of activation minus the energy that is released then this one was a big value and this one was a small. And again, you can see that the end result is that delta H is going to be greater than zero. Now, I want to show you how these uh, symbols of delta H actually work on the energy profiles. So let's go back and look at the energy profiles and see how we would represent delta H. Here's the exothermic reaction. And I hope you can see that what we're doing here is we're finding the difference between two levels. If we put a straight line in over there, let's make that straight. And we put another straight line. Just want to change the color of it. Put another straight line in roughly where the, the product is. It's not very accurate. The difference between these two that difference between those straight lines, that's delta H. And in this case, I hope you can see that you're going to get a negative answer. So delta H here is going to be less than zero because we're taking the product, which is smaller, and we're subtracting a bigger value. And when we do that, delta H is going to be less than zero. If we do the same sort of thing over here, um, what you should notice is you've got the same idea over there, and we put the green line in over here. It's the difference between these two. That's the delta H. So you're sometimes asked to label the delta H on a graph. It's the difference between the product and the reactant. Product over here, big value, reactant, small value, delta H is going to be positive. There's more energy put in, less released, so we're going to get a delta H that is positive. Now, <clears throat> there's one further thing that I think that you need to bear note of. 
This is particularly important when we take a look at these energy profiles with respect to what you're going to need to know for grade 12. I just want to take a minute just to revise an important idea that you might not be examined on in grade 11, but is really an important idea for you to look at for grade 12. And that's the idea that reactions can be reversible. So if we have a reaction and we start with A2 plus B2 and we're going to make 2AB. Then what you should recognize is that's called the forward reaction. But in some cases, what happens is that we can get a similar reaction. We can get a reaction where we start with 2AB and it decomposes to form A2 plus B2. This is known as the reverse or back reaction. Now, these aren't uncommon. You can synthesize something. Another way of saying this is this could be called a synthesis reaction, and this is a decomposition reaction. They don't have to be happening at the same time. In some cases, they can. But you can see that the process is reversible. Reversible. Not all reactions are reversible, though. So please bear that in mind. Sometimes it's just impractical to make a reaction reversible. But if we've got a reversible reaction, like this one, What's the energy profile going to look like? I'm going to sketch that for you just to give you an example. And let's say that the forward reaction, we're going to make it exothermic. So delta H is negative, less than zero. So if we draw the energy profile for this reversible reaction, we're going to get the following idea. Put the labels in. First forward reaction was, was exothermic. So I just want to make that up a little bit, make it a bit bigger. There we go. So these are your reactants. This was A2 plus B2, and this was 2AB. Remember, this is your product of your reversible reaction. This is your reactant of your forward reaction. So I don't want to put those labels in just at the moment. I just want to put that in as it stands. This is energy and this is your reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate. Right. Let's mark the forward reaction in the orange color. Then we would say that this is the activation energy of the forward reaction. And this one is going to be the energy released of the forward reaction. Okay? But on the same energy profile, I can label the reverse reaction. Let's have a look at that. Notice that in the reverse reaction we said we start with 2AB and we end with that. So this is going to be the reactant for the reverse reaction. That's, those are the reactant. And these are the products. We're starting with that for the reverse reaction. So if we apply that idea, then this is going to be the activation energy for the reverse reaction. And this is going to be the energy that's released for the reverse reaction. So notice something here that's very, very interesting. Is that the same process is taking place and that for both of these reactions, the value between 
the reactant and the product, this value, which we said the difference there is delta H, stays the same. For the forward reaction, for the forward reaction, the orange one, so what we will notice is that for the forward reaction, delta H is negative, but for the green reaction, going backwards, delta H is greater than zero. It's positive because the forward reaction is exothermic, while the reverse reaction is endothermic. When these two reactions take place together at the same time, then we usually take, well, we always take the forward reaction. We take the sign of the forward reaction as being the delta H for that particular reaction. Okay, now we come to the last point that we want to summarize for this section, and that's the idea of a catalyst. So what do you understand by the idea of a catalyst? Well, it's quite interesting because if we go back to our original idea of two things combining, and I'm just going to use this uh, again, two molecules, and they're going to need uh, to combine. We know that they're going to form uh, something like that. We might need to give them some help. And this is where we introduce a, another substance. And the other substance I'm just going to draw in two ways. I'm going to draw it first of all just as a surface, and we're going to say the following thing could happen. What we can find is to get the activation complex, we need a somewhere for some things to stick on to. If these were gases, what we sometimes find is that a surface acts very nicely to hold things in place. So, for example, we can get th those molecules sitting nicely in position, they're not moving around, and along can come your um, green molecule, sit on top of it, form a more stable, it's slightly more stable activation complex, and then it can uh, be released. This is known as a surface catalyst, and the mechanism here is often used where in industry, for example, a metal like platinum likes to absorb gases, and the platinum surface then becomes a site for reactions. Catalysts are very important industrial processes because what they do is they allow the reactions to take place in a more controlled way. The other interesting thing is that we find that catalysts can actually use up less energy in making the reaction happen. So the molecules don't have to collide with each other so vigorously. They've actually got a place where they can lock in. Now, catalysts aren't only found in industry, they're also found in human beings, in living organisms. They're also known biologically as enzymes. The idea is here that a catalyst actually facilitates, it helps a reaction take place, but it is not used up. It's not consumed. It just aids and assists the reaction, and it does it by lowering the activation energy. Now, what do you think about it in this way? Kind of like if we draw that energy profile again. Let's take just a sketch graph of an energy profile. I won't draw too accurately. We've got the mountain, something like that. Then a catalyst. It works in a way to lower the activation energy. So if this was the activation energy of the forward reaction, then what happens is the catalyst provides an alternative route, and the alternative route has a lower activation energy. So instead of having as big an energy hill to climb, what it does is it provides a tunnel through the mountain, and that becomes your catalyzed energy profile. This is for with a catalyst. Okay, so you'll notice that it is still an exothermic react or endothermic reaction in this case. It doesn't change the nature of that. It doesn't change the delta H either. Notice delta H is still the same. Doesn't change. Still the same. But what it does, it lowers the activation energy. 
you get different types of catalysts. You get those that are a different medium. So if you've got gases reacting and a metal surface, those are called heterogeneous, or heterogeneous uh, catalysts. And then you get homogeneous catalysts, where we actually add stuff to a, a sample that's of the same phase. And these are two different mechanisms for working. A very big process, a very big area of research in industry, because if you can get uh, catalysts working, then you can get more energy efficient reactions taking place. Okay, well, I hope that gives you a summary of what the key concepts that you will need to know for this section. Let's now go and have a look at some questions that we're going to be looking at. So let's start by looking at question number one. The example says the contact process, now you will learn about this more in, in grade 12, is used for the preparation of sulfuric acid. Sulfur trioxide is pre prepared by reacting sulfur dioxide with oxygen and vanadium pentoxide is the catalyst. So we recognize that. There's the balanced equation. And what we're told is we've got two sulfur dioxide plus oxygen uh, plus, uh, and it forms the product. These are the reactants. And this is the product. And notice now delta H is less than zero. What does less than zero mean? I hope you remember delta H less than zero means it's a negative value. Negative means that it is exothermic. When you see this sign, please make sure that for, you, for yourself you write negative or positive so you can remember it. Now, what does it say? Draw the potential energy versus reaction coordinate graph for the above reaction. Now, we aren't given any values, so we can just draw a sketch graph. And really what they're asking for is a little sketch of a, an exothermic reaction, but we need to put all the labels in. So if we draw that as our potential energy, label it. Potential energy could be measured in kilojoules or in joules. Put the units in. Reaction coordinate doesn't have units. Co co uh, coordinate. It doesn't have units. Now, what have we got? We've got sulfur dioxide plus oxygen. Those are our reactants. So we need to recognize, let's give them a little bit more potential energy to start with. We're going to say SO2 plus O2. Label this as reactant. We don't know the activation energy, but we know that the energy of the product is going to be less. I just want to get that in the same color. So the energy profile or the graph is going to look something like this. Fill in what the product is. It's SO3. And write down that that's the product so that people can see. And now let's put in the other labels. This is the activation complex. This one over here is going to be your activation energy. And this is your energy released. Right. Last thing that we need to always label on an energy profile is the, the reading of delta H. And you can put dotted lines in and then just indicate that that's your delta H over there. And indicate that delta H is going to be equal to Remember, the energy of the product, which is small, the energy of the product minus the energy of the reactant, which is a bigger value. So it's going to be less than zero. Okay, I think we've done it for this first graph. 
please remember your labels. They're very important. And uh, let's move on having done that. The next question is, is the reaction exothermic or endothermic? And it says, define the terms to illustrate your answer. So we're going to have to answer the first question first and then define the terms. So we're going to say um, the reaction is exothermic. That asked us to give a reason. We would say delta H is negative. And now let's go and define the term. Exothermic. Exothermic reactions. Reactions are reactions. in which more energy is released than absorbed or you could say the energy of the product is less than the energy of the reactants. Now what about the endothermic? Well, we're going to do exactly the same definition. We're going to say endothermic reactions reactions are reactions in which more energy is absorbed than released. Or we can say the energy of the product is greater than the energy of the reactants. So delta H is going to be greater than zero. OK, we've got it. We've sorted it. We've given a full explanation. Please make sure that you, you don't um, skimp. Uh, don't, you must make sure you answer the question and explain uh, in, in detail. Right, what's the third part of this question? Now, here's an interesting one. It says to us, we want to calculate the molecular mass of each of the substances. Let me say, well, what has this got to do with energy? Well, sometimes they can include other sections of work in this one. And so uh, it's a chemistry question that we should really remember. And so what we're going to need to do is calculate the molar mass, molecular mass of SO2 and the molar mass of SO3 and the molar mass of oxygen. And it's not difficult, so let's do it quickly. We're going to say, looking up on the periodic table, sulfur has a relative atomic mass of 32. Oxygen is 16 times 2. So we're going to recognize, if we multiply those two together, we get 64 grams per mole. Now, the next one doesn't take much to see. It's 32 plus 16 times 3. And in this case, 3 is 48. That gives you 80 grams per mole. Now, the last one is one that we've done already. It's 16 times 2, which is equal to 32 grams per mole. Now, the reason that that was included as a question as part of this section is sometimes the values of delta H are given not just in kilojoules, but they're given in kilojoules per mole, and that per mole stands for kilojoules per mole of product. 
And you've got to look at the balanced equation very carefully to calculate the exact amount of energy. So there are energy calculations that can occur with those ones. We might come across one of those um, as we go through these questions. Let's move on to question number two. Now, question number two is an interesting one because it takes a real example. I'm going to read through it slowly and let's pick up the key information. It talks about the bombardier beetle fights off enemies with a chemical spray. The beetle has two glands. One gland has an aqueous solution of hydroquinine, quinone, and one of hydrogen peroxide. The other gland contains a mixture of enzymes. Remember we said enzymes are catalysts. When threatened, the beetle squeezes fluid from the first gland into the other compartment. In the presence of enzymes, a reaction takes place. And so here we've got the chemical reactions that take place. Uh, this is your hydroquinone, and it is an aqueous solution. It produces um, another substance, not worried about the name of it, plus hydrogen. We're told that the delta H for this is 177 kilojoules. Notice it's a positive value. Then we're told that we've got peroxide that forms water and oxygen, and this is a negative value. Then the next thing is that the hydrogen plus the oxygen produces water, which is also a negative value. Final combined reaction is that your hydroquinone plus your peroxide gives you another substance plus water. And now it indicates something interesting. It says, show by means of calculation that the mixture rejected by the beetle is extremely hot. So what are we required to do here? Well, we've been given the parts of the reactions. We know the energy requirements of these parts. Let's start to use these so that we can calculate the overall heat of reaction, the overall enthalpy. So we'll do that right away. So what we want to do is we want to look at the total energy. We'll say total energy. Well, what do we know? Um, we first of all need to take a look at the energy that is taken in or absorbed taken in. And we're going to add that to the energy released. So if we look at those reactions, notice the requirement for this one is that we need to absorb. When it's a positive, you need to absorb it. This is a requirement you need to absorb. This is released. This is released. Okay? So, what we're going to do is we take those values and add them together. We get 177 plus, now, add the negative values together, and you should see that you've got minus 94,6 plus minus... 286. When you add those together all together, you'll get a negative 302,6 kilojoules. Notice that the negative sign here tells you this is energy released. The overall reaction has a delta H that is less than zero. So what we recognize is that the substance that is being produced as the spray must be released and it's got really hot. Um, and so the, it explains the answer. So that this is extremely hot. 302,6 uh, kilojoules is, of energy is coming out with each mole of substance that is released. That's a huge amount. Now, we might not be submitting or releasing a whole mole of substance, but we're releasing enough energy uh, that I hope you can see that it will, in fact, be very hot. 
Okay, what is the next question? And again, it tells us to sketch the graph of potential energy for the equation number one. Please don't go and do the overall reaction. Notice it tells you equation number one, which is delta H, is a positive value. We've already identified it. I'm just going to do the sketch very quickly because we've done a number of these already. So you should recognize for an endothermic reaction, something like that. But please notice something. We've got a specific reaction. So we must annotate the, the graph with these particular things. So we're going to say C6H4, C6H4O2, and that was our reactant. And the product, oh, sorry, it was O, o H2. Let's just redo that. I just saw it was wrong. So the reactant is going to be C6H4OH twice. And the product we'll take from up here is C6H4O2 plus H2. So C6H4O2 plus H2. That's the product. Or the products. This is the reactant. Now, we don't know what the activation energy is. We don't know what this value is. We're not told it. That's the activation energy. Still put it in. We don't know how much energy is released. That's the energy that is released. But what we do know is the difference between these two. And we need to, to label it and to put it in. This value is delta H, which is equal to, put in the right value, 177, 177 kilojoules. And th that makes the fully labeled diagram complete. I hope you can see that um, you've got the activation energy very clearly. Uh, all the things are labeled. We need to also label the axes. We're going to say energy potential energy measured in kilojoules and this is your reaction coordinate okay um, and this is the energy profile for reaction one. Good. I think you've got it. Make sure that you understand that this energy profile is for an endothermic reaction. Okay, let's move on to the next question. It says, explain the significance of the negative values in graphs uh, one and two. So if we were to draw the graphs one and two, uh, sorry, uh, two and three, if we were to look at those two, we've said it already, uh, two and three are exothermic reactions. Delta H is going to be less than zero. Right. Um, I don't think that there is much more that we can say, unless you want to elaborate, that more energy, more energy is released than absorbed. Right, let's move to the last part of this. Should, why should people be cautious? Very important question uh, about playing with bombardier beetles. Well, bombardier beetles might think that you're an enemy. And if they think you're an enemy, they're going to attack. It's a defense mechanism. They're going to squirt some of this, this toxic mixture onto you. Toxic mixture might not be terribly poisonous, might not affect you, but it is hot. So the, 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 um, the mixture squirted in defense is hot. 
And that can, can cause damage, particularly if um, it happens that it gets into your eyes and it could burn you on your skin. So um, be very careful. We don't want to, to annoy things in nature. Just leave nature to itself. Right. Let's move on to question number three now, and let's have a look at what this one says. It says, during the process of cellular resp respiration, cellular respiration, glucose is broken down to form carbon dioxide and water according to the following equation. We're told that C6, H12, O6 plus oxygen produces carbon dioxide and water. And there we've got an energy profile. Clearly showing there are your reactants. And there are your products. Notice your activation energy is indicated over here. This will be your activation complex. And you can see that more energy is released than is absorbed. So what are we asking? Is the breakdown of glucose endothermic or exothermic? Have a careful look at the diagram again and you make your decision. Look at the energy of the product. It's a smaller value than the energy of the reactant. So if we take energy of product, subtract the energy of the reactant, we're going to get a negative value. The activation energy minus the energy released, it's going to be less than zero. Less than zero means that it is exothermic. Okay, I hope that you can see that the questions in this section aren't particularly difficult. They're very, they can be quite re repetitive, in fact, but there are some similarities between the questions. And once you've got the, the key ideas, you uh, can sort it out. It says, explain how enzymes influence the rate of the reaction. Now, rate of reaction tells you over here that the reaction is catalyzed by enzymes. Now, catalyst means that it's going to lower the activation energy. So it's going to do something like this. It's not going to change the delta H or anything. It's just going to decrease the activation energy. So what that means is that if you've got enzymes, you're going to be able to produce, you'll produce more product under the same condition in a shorter time. With, um, without increasing energy. So you could actually reduce energy. If you reduce the energy that was required, you lowered the temperature or whatever the case was, um, you would produce the same amount of stuff. But if you were using the same environment, so standard temperature, 25 degrees, you add a catalyst, you're going to produce um, in a certain amount of time. If you started with a certain number of moles of stuff, more of those moles could react if they were in excess. Um, so things would happen faster. And that's what we mean by reaction rate, the speed at which something uh, reacts. And we see that a catalyst lowers the activation energy, and so it produces um, more product in a shorter space of time or in the same space of time. Okay, 3.3 uh, says, is the reverse reaction endo or exothermic? So let's look at the, the energy profile. Remember what a reverse reaction is? We're going to now start with these as my reactants. And we're going to say, there's my activation energy for my reverse reaction. And this is the energy released. And so what do we reckon? Can you see that the activation energy is greater for the reverse reaction, less energy released? So we would be able to say that the reverse reaction is endothermic. Very simple reason. 
that the activation energy is greater than the energy that is released. The endothermic for the reverse reaction. Okay, right, now let's move on to the next question, which is 3.4. And here we go. The oxygen molecule in this reaction is broken up into two oxygen atoms. So we've got molecules broken up into two atoms. Explain the changes in potential energy and distance between the atoms. Okay, now this is a very important idea. Because we're talking about energy, where is this energy and chemical change going into? Well, we do need to understand that the reason that energy is required because there's a breaking and a making of bonds. So if we take a look at the oxygen molecule, should know that between two oxygen molecules there is a double bond. And we need to break that double bond to make oxygen atoms. Now those oxygen atoms aren't stable. Um, you can look up on a table to find out the energy that's required for that. I, on one table that I've got here, it says there's 497 kilojoules of energy required to break that double bond. So what do you need to recognize is that in the process of forming a new substance, you're going to need to have some energy to break up the bonds. They're at a certain distance. And what happens is that as you supply the energy, you supply the conditions, the oxygen atoms are able to move further apart because they've, they've released some of their energy. Uh, you've added energy and you've been able to pull them apart. So they've moved further apart and so they are freer to move. Now that doesn't mean that this oxygen atom is going to stay like that. In this state, we know that the oxygen atom is unstable and it actually wants a partner. So it's going to look for something else and in this case it's going to get hold of that, that other substance that we started with which was the glucose and it's going to combine to form the products that we're looking for which are carbon dioxide and water and so that's an ongoing process. But I want you to see that the energy stored in this bond, there's an energy stored in this bond um, which is equivalent to the energy that you need to break the bond. So that's the energy that's required to break the bond. And as a result of supplying that energy, the, uh, the oxygen atoms are free to move further apart. When they do move further apart, um, then they are unstable. When they're together at this bond length, with this particular, they're at their lowest energy. They have their lowest potential energy. They don't like being like that, they're unstable, but over here they're low. So the minimum energy you're going to need to do is the bond energy. Bond energy, the energy to break the bond. Uh, when the bond is broken, they're moving further apart, and so the energy over here, the potential energy, will actually increase because they are going to have potential to, to combine with other things. So when we do that, the um, recognize that as they're far apart, they're, they've not, they're not holding that much energy any, anymore. They're going to need more energy when they reform bonds and they might need to break that uh, and release that energy. Okay, question four. The diagram below shows a system in which potential energy of a chemical system is represented by the equation and the equation that we're looking at is two carbon monoxide plus oxygen to give you two molecules or moles of carbon dioxide. Notice the temperature is given as 304 Kelvin. Temperature is obviously uh, a critical factor in terms of, of dealing with, with chemical reactions. We're given this graph where it gives us some readings values for potential energy. And they say, from the graph, what is the potential energy of the reactants in the above reaction? Now remember the reactants are these things. It's the carbon monoxide and oxygen. And on the graph, we recognize that the reactants 
are these ones. So look at the graph very carefully. You recognize that these are the reactants, these are the products. And we're wanting to know what is the potential energy of the reactants. So the reactants, remember, were carbon monoxide plus oxygen. Just filling those in so you've got it very clearly. And you can see that it's going to be 120 kilojoules. Reading from the graph, we've got that line very clearly. Now, the next thing, it says, what is the potential energy of the products in the above reaction? Now, we've identified the products are over there. And all we need to do is to read across here and see that we've got 320. 320 kilojoules. Now, recognize that this is the energy of the product. This is the energy of the reactant. Next question, write down the value for the activation energy for the reaction. Now, we're only dealing with the forward reaction. Um, but I hope you can see that the energy of the product, of the, of the reactant, there's the activation complex. So that's the activation complex. And so from the graph, we can read off that it's the difference between where we started and where the activation complex is. So what we're going to do is to recognize what activation energy is. Activation energy is the energy of the activation complex minus the energy of the reactant. And if we look at that from the graph, should be able to see that it's 500 kilojoules per mole, uh, kilojoules minus 120. So 500 minus 120, which is going to give you your answer of 300 and 80 kilojoules. Please don't forget your units. Units are really important in all science calculations. You must make sure that you've got your units in place. Okay, now the next question says, what is the value of delta H for the forward reaction? Now, that's not too difficult. There are two ways of, of doing it, and I want to, to illustrate both of those. We're going to recognize that we can take the energy of the product, which is a higher value, and subtract the energy of the reactant. So delta H is equal to the energy of the product minus the energy of the reactants. And we got those over here. The energy of the reactant was 120. The energy of the product was 320. So it's 320 minus 120. And that will give you 200 kilojoules. Now, just to make sure that we've got that, that that is correct, I want you to see that we can do it the other way. But first of all, we would need to use the graph to calculate the energy released. So this energy that is released in forming the products. When the products form, those atoms combine and they make new bonds. When they become stable, they release or give off some energy. Um, and that is because they've attained their lowest potential energy. They don't want to have extra energy which could make some instability or instability in the bond. So let's calculate the energy that's released. And I hope you can see that that's 50. Uh, so if we've got the difference between 320 and 500, then we're going to say 500 minus 320, that's going to give you, let's just use the calculator, Don't, being a bit lazy there, 500 minus 320, and we can get 180 is the energy released. So, One eighty is in kilojoules is the energy released. Right now we've got the energy released and we calculated the activation energy earlier. So let's use these to 
prove and to confirm the value for delta H using the second definition. Remember, we said delta H is equal to the activation energy minus the energy released. Writing that in, activation energy, 380, minus the 180 that we've got, and that gives us 200 kilojoules. And look, that was exactly the value that we, we got over here earlier, using the difference between the product and the reactant energy. So we can see that things work in both ways to give us the correct delta H. We can represent delta H on the graph, and let's remember how we do that. We represent delta H on the graph as the difference between there and there. So if you're asked to show on a graph, you've got that value is the delta H. Quite clearly over here, we've got that. Now, there's one little thing that I want to just mention about this energy released. I just want to confirm for you and to remind you that that energy released is actually the activation energy of the reverse reaction. So if we were to say that this was a reversible reaction, then th that would be the activation energy of the reverse reaction. So don't forget that. Now, last question, which isn't terribly difficult. You should be all shouting the answer by now. <coughs> it says, is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? Motivate your answer. Well, it's not too difficult to see that since delta H is equal to plus 200 kilojoules, this means that delta H is greater than zero. It means that more energy was absorbed than released. And if that's the case, we must answer the question. The first part of the question, is it endothermic or exothermic? It is endothermic. Because of these reasons, the delta H is positive. It's greater than zero because more energy was absorbed than released. Of course, you could also say that the energy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. And I think that brings us to the end of the example questions. Now, there are some exercise questions for you to do. And I want to just take you through, there are just two ex exercise questions. I want to take you through the key points of those exercise questions and give you some tips on how to answer them. So please remember in this first question, read the question very carefully. Notice that you're given the symbol. And again, the question, is it exothermic or endothermic? Remember, exo means out and thermic means heat. And endo means in, and thermic means heat. So which one is it? Make sure you've got your definitions. Delta H here, which is bigger? Delta H or the zero? Well, the crocodile snaps to the zero, so delta H is less than zero. So it's a negative value. Now, we've done so many of these, you should really be able to identify that very carefully and very easily. The next part of the question, it says, does the energy of the products, how does the energy of the products compare to the energy of the reactants? So we need to just look at the energy profile. Might not be a bad thing to just sketch a simple example of this energy profile so you can see, is the product bigger than the reactant? And make sure that you've got that right. The next part of the, uh, of the exercise is you're given another um, part of the contact process and we're asked to draw some diagrams. So you're asked again to draw the energy diagram, the energy profile. Note what you're required to do. The activation energy for the forward reaction, the activation energy for the reverse reaction. Label the activation con uh, um, complex and then 
Look at the heat of reaction or enthalpy of the forward and reverse reactions. There's a little bit of a trick question there. I hope you've picked up on it and make sure that you don't fall into a trap. It's not particularly difficult. Okay, um, I think the last part of the question is then to, to recognize, is it endo or exothermic? And we've done enough of those sort of questions. And then is the reverse reaction endo or or exothermic. And again, just apply the principles that we've gone over. Now, I think that brings us to the end of the exercise questions. I just want to make sure that you are very comfortable. In this section, you need to understand activation energy, activation complex, the energy profile, whether something's exo or endothermic, and then make sure that you understand the role of a catalyst. Hope you've enjoyed this being with me this today, and uh, I wish you all the best. Remember, this is an important section because it leads on to work that you're going to need to know in grade 12. Practice hard, and I wish you all, all the best for your coming exams.